went to the house and found her passed out on the floor, naked, wrapped in mink. <laughs> Get it to him now. Hello, black hole. Well, hello there, love bugs. Hello there, bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Today's looky looky would be our Miss Chi Chi Shades and our Renee Scarf. I think this one is number five, okay? I'm really into these scarves right now, especially in this hot ass heat down here in Atlanta. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, yeah, sure, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's talk about the shortest, thickest, black maid on television, Miss Nail. So look y'all, my dog is going through it back there. He having zoomies right now. And if you hear like stuff, you know, like all over the place, random barking, grunting, you know, zooming and stuff, that's him. <coughs> if he sat his bitch ass down, then he wouldn't be there. Nell Ruth Hardy was born September 13th, 1948 in Birmingham, Alabama. One of nine children born to Edna May and Horace Hardy, she was born into a Roman Catholic family and raised Presbyterian. Carter self-identified as Pentecostal. When she was only two years old, her father was electrocuted when he stepped on a live power line in full view of Nail. As a child, she began singing on a local gospel radio show and was also a member of the church choir. At age 15, she began performing at area coffee houses and later joined the Renaissance Ensemble that played at area coffee houses and gay bars. Didn't I tell you the gays will always save the day? If you just average and the gays like you, oh, they'll push you to excellent. I'm telling you, if the gays believe in you, baby, you have made it. That's why I'm so grateful for all the gays that follow me. I love you. I love you because y'all believe in me. At 16 years old. Okay, in July of 1965, Nell was R word. Okay, I hate saying that word because it's such an ugly word, especially for those of us who have actually experienced it. So um, what happened, we're going to go through this briefly, but what happened was Nell was catching a ride home from a person who she knew, whether it was a close friend or an associate, it was someone she knew. Okay, just out of the blue, I guess the nigga decided I'm ready to, you know, take advantage of this woman, put that thing in her face and was like, give it up. As a result of the R word, she had a daughter, Tracy. Now, at the time, she found it very difficult to raise the child. Okay, um, Man, I give kudos to anyone that is able to suffer such a tragic event, produce a child, and is still able to successfully raise that child. I mean, because you can raise the child, but take it out on the child every day because how the child manifested. But Nell did find it hard to raise baby Tracy. As a result, Tracy, the baby, was given to her sister, Willie. 
Willie raised the child as her own. It's not uncommon for things like this to happen, especially in black families. Well, we've joked about this before, but in my family, to be quite honest with you, I really don't know who a cousin is or who a sister or brother is in my family because all of my aunts had their children very young, right? I told you my mom was 15 when she had me. She would later claim that Tracy was a product of a brief merge, but she revealed the truth in a 1994 interview. In 1978, Carter socially tried cocaine and eventually became hooked. Let me tell you what my perspective is on her cocaine choice. She said she was at an award show. It was boogity shoogity everywhere and they just offered her to her. So um, when I watched several of her interviews that um, addressed her booger sugar abuse, right? She said she was at an award show and they offered it to me. The interviewer said, well, who is they? Nell was reluctant to say specifically who the they were. So one time early in my gaydom, I was messing with a woman who was younger than me that was into drugs. I didn't know how much she was into drugs. And one day we had went down tracks in Southwest DC. Tracks is not there anymore, but it was a, a good, great place to party. So we went out with a couple of her gay friends. You wanna go in the bathroom with me and do some Special K? No, I don't know what Special K is. I know it's a drug, but I don't like the fact that my partner's friends were offering me that. Later on, I learned that she did have a cocaine habit that I didn't know about. Right. Right. But ultimately, what I'm saying is that even though they can offer you the drug, you still can say no. To get back to Nell Carter, Nell had said basically, when you're in a business, the they's are always there, waiting. 1981 and Miss Nell is 33 years old and she is now the star of Give Me a Break. Give me a break, I sure deserve it. It's time I made it to the top. Mm. Give me a break, I'm looking forward. Get behind me, pull out every stop. Hey, I want a happy ending. I'm tired of pretending. Don't let them get the best of me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Give me a break. The game is survival. Give me a break and plan my arrival. Give me a break, go oh, heaven sake. What happened to my piece of the cake? Give me a break. The sitcom aired for the first time October 29th, 1981. I was 10 years old. It was the best thing on television to me, y'all. It takes place in Glen Lawn, a fictional suburb in California. Nellie Ruth Nell Harper, Nell Carter now, agrees to look after the Kaniski household as a special favor to her dying friend, Margaret Huffman Kaniski, played in flashback by Sharon Spellman, who was the wife of police chief Carl Kaniski, Dolph Sweet. Daughters Katie, Carrie Michelson, Julie, Lori Hindler, and Samantha, Laura Jill Miller. The youngest daughter, Samantha, had a special bond with Nell. Now, what I thought was disturbing was that as the youngest character on the show, she said she saw way too many drugs on the set. And what she noticed was that Nell would have her moods. She would be a certain way and then disappear and then come back and she was on point. Despite the success of the show, Nell continued to indulge in food, 
Shopping and booger sugar. Now, I know you're like, nay, you keep going to the left. I'm sorry, my bad, okay? Let's talk about food, okay? I will always say to you that I will struggle with a sugar addiction forever. Just like drugs can be an addiction, so can food. I told y'all that time I was on a honey bun a day diet. Oh, I'm serious about that. Another addiction that I had that I didn't even realize was an addiction. Shopping. I had no idea until I met another person that was just like me. She told me or explained to me about how her shopping addiction was so bad that once she bought all the things she wanted for herself, she started buying things for other people. Her credit cards were maxed. It was something about her receiving a delivery every day that filled her up. At night when she was feeling empty, she would go on the internet, find something that she did not have, find it, push the button, pay for it, however it was she paid for it, and then receive it in the morning. She said she has so much shit in her house. Give me a break, it's at its peak. And she has a drug and alcohol addiction, a food addiction, and a shopping addiction. So let me say something in regards to her weight that I never paid attention to when I was watching the show originally. Yes, I'm young, but it for some reason didn't matter to me as a young person, right? I was like 10, 11, 12, 13 years old when this show was going on. But they said at this time when the show is at its peak that she is 4'11", didn't realize how short she was, and um, 200 pounds. I'm still saying, well, wait a minute. Okay, I watch my 600 pound life every goddamn day. And to me, for a person to be obese, you know, that's pretty good. At that age, I never paid attention to Nell's weight, never. But I think it's because Nell dressed so well. The clothes that she wore were so fitting for her body that I never ever thought that she was fat. Never. Did y'all pay attention to that when you first saw the show? Was you like, oh, she's a short, fat, black maid? I never paid attention to that. I just thought she was sassy. Because in actuality, when I look at the show now as an adult, I'm like, Nell wasn't nothing but boobs and ass. Nothing. I didn't see no gut. I just thought she had some big ass knockers and a big old butt. The drugs never affected her work. So the director, nor NBC, never bothered to care. Carter, married, mathematician, and lumber executive, George Kronicki. And she converted to Judaism in 1982. Also in 1982, things became obvious. Remember I told you it's never a problem until it's a problem. What had happened one day, Nell was supposed to meet a big exec, a VIP type person. Her ass never showed. They thought that it was different for her not to take care of business. Now they know she on the booger sugar, but wait a minute, Nell is always about her business. They went to the house and found her passed out on the floor, naked, wrapped in mink. <laughs> Get it to him now. So as a result, she went to a rehab. The ratings are still soaring. Give Me a Break is the hottest thing on television or one of the hottest things on television. Okay? All right, so it's 1983, okay? She didn't got out of rehab, but she's pulling junkie stunts. The problem now is now is not taking care of business like how she used to. Maybe because she has this arrogant thing or very confident about her abilities on give me a break after all the show is centered around her because remember this the execs from nbc picked her specifically because they thought that she was so sassy in the play the musical a misbehaving i'm saving all my love for you she pulling stunts okay she ain't even going to rehearsals no more but they not worried because when it comes to showtime, she's there and she's on point. Okay? All right, Ms. Nail. The third season, she's on her second Emmy nom. And here comes Joy Lawrence. You know Joy Lawrence is 
batshit crazy right now. Joy Lawrence, I love you. They found him on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. So back then in the 80s, what was a sure win was to find a cute kid and Joey Lawrence fit the bill. But like I said, Joey Lawrence is nuts because I am an avid Big Brother fan, child. And when he was on Celebrity Big Brother, I was like, damn, Joey, you done turned crazy. And I always thought he was an attractive guy, but damn, Joey. In addition to Joey on that third season came Telma Hawkins. Addie. Now, let me tell you something about that damn Addie. That lady is still working. I think she is originally from Tony, Orlando, and Dawn. She gonna, she gonna be like Cicely Tyson. Remember how Tyler Perry had Cicely Tyson working until she died? But Angie, y'all, the first friend that Nell had, that lady was, I mean, goddamn, I know she couldn't have been that stupid in real life. Angie was like seven feet tall and skinny. And then you got her standing next to this short, thick nail carter. I mean, I guess it worked for that time. But Angie just, I don't know. She just went upstairs and just never came back down. She's making 50K a week, but spending 2K a day on potted donuts. And I'm not talking about the ones she eats or you eat, okay? I'm talking about the boogity sugary. So now her dude, Kaniki. Ain't feeling her no more. Maybe now he knows about her booger sugar habit. He didn't know at first. She hid that shit successfully. Now he like, I don't want to be bothered with you no more. Okay. So in this moment of depression, she travels overseas to go see her friend, the Eliza Minnelli, Miss Judy Garland's daughter. When you're the daughter of the original Judy, you have no other choice but to be magnificent. She goes overseas to see Liza, and while she there, she decides to hurt herself, or at least try to hurt herself by taking sleeping pills and alcohol. Liza was like, no, we get ready to get you into a rehab. Nell said she had to get herself together when she was over there because what she didn't want to do is go back to that particular rehab ever again. She said they had her over there mopping floors and washing windows, okay? And that is not what the fabulous Nell Carter did. Did I mention to you that was the flyest big girl on television back then? The only other, y'all, ooh, do this, y'all, just, just to, um, what's that word? Just humor me, okay? Put below the flyest black women on television in the 80s, okay? I would say it would be Nell. I would say uh, Louise Jefferson. Of course, Diane Carroll in Dynasty, baby. Who else? Good times wasn't on in the 80s. Uh, who else? Y'all, I can't think. Put it down below. Tell me. The flyest black women on television in the 80s. Oh, and Roxy Roker. She was fly as shit, too. Oh, Felicia Rashad. So anyway, she emerged from the rehab in 1984, clean and sober, 98 pounds slimmer. She picked the weight back up quickly, though, okay? I mean, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know what to say. In 1985, Dolph Sweet died of cancer. Season 5, episode 1, dealt with the loss. Dolph's death left a hole in the cast. Fifth season... Clean, sober, and separated, NBC is tapping on the producer's door. You're going to have to do something with this nail. Some big changes got to be done because we can't have this black maid taking care of these white girls with the uprising of the Cosby show. You got the black maid against the doctor and the lawyer. That can't happen. Them motherfuckers can't even be on the same day. That okay, okay, NBC. Oh, it was good for her to be a mammy while it was working. But now, Bill Cosby in play, now you just want to throw her away. Five episodes into the sixth and final season, the show changed locales from Glenlawn to New York City. When Nell, concerned for Joey's welfare after he moved there with his absentee father, traveled there to check on him. She subsequently assumed guardianship of Joey and the younger brother, Matthew, played by Joey Lawrence's real-life brother, Matthew Lawrence, at their father's request, and was forced to permanently relocate there after Chief Kaniski, Father Stanley, John Hoyt, sold the family's Glenlawn home. 
As a result of these big changes, the girls were fired. I didn't know that. I didn't know that them girls were fired. That's kind of fucked up. The middle one, what is her name? I don't know. But the middle one was like, how you gonna fire me? I just, I just bought a house, girl. That's just be how it be sometimes, girl. girl. The youngest daughter, Samantha, said she became a lawyer. The oldest daughter was like, well, I'm happy. 1986-87, Rosie O'Donnell was added and still in the scenes. Nell was very disrespectful. Can't you see it? Nell didn't want no parts of Rosie O'Donnell because, you know, this is when she's coming up through the ranks. This is where Rosie O'Donnell starts to make her mark on television. Nell called him when I seen an interview talking about Rosie. She was like, it ain't my fault that she don't know how to handle business on set. Nell wasn't feeling her. I don't know that lady. Fuck her. Why is she here for? Now, Rosie O'Donnell there, the ratings are flailing, but it doesn't matter because the show is now in syndication. That means money. On May 12th, 1987, after six seasons, the show aired its final episode. Two years later, she returned to her husband and miscarried twice, then divorced. Next, she adopted a black baby boy. When she went to the hospital to go get the baby boy, there was another child sitting right there who needed that mammy too. Okay, so she said, I can afford it. Come on, wrap that one up, and I'll bring both of them. In June of 1992, she married record producer Roger LeBrock. All was well except for her diabetes and obesity. She is now close to 300 pounds. Okay, now, like I told you, I, I'm an avid, my 600-pound life watcher. Okay, because sometimes when I want to sit around and eat ice cream all day, ooh, the butter pecan, y'all, the butter pecan. But when I want to sit around and eat ice cream all day, sometimes I need to watch that show to help check myself. I didn't see on my 600-pound life where somebody was 700 pounds and 4'11". I said, I don't know how this bitch is living. Later, okay. she had a double brain aneurysm. In 2002, she was divorced, thinner, doing independent films and television again. January 2003, she is back on stage with Raisin. During an interview, she explained she was not feeling well. On January 23, 2003, Carter, age 54, collapsed and died at her home in Beverly Hills. Her son Joshua discovered her body that night. Per a provision in Carter's will, no autopsy was performed. Using blood tests, x-rays, and a physical examination, the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office ruled that Carter's death was the likely result of heart disease and diabetes. Carter was survived by her partner, Ann Kaiser. Now, that knocked me for a loop, but then it didn't. Because sometimes when women can't find their happiness in men, like all bitches do, they think, let me find a woman. Women know how to understand women. It ain't that simple. All you curious bitches, let me tell you something. It's harder dealing with a woman than it is a nigga. Carter was survived by her partner, Ann Kaiser, who inherited her property and custody of her two sons. She is buried at Hillside Memorial Park Cemetery in Los Angeles. <laughs>
if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, vituptopbeauty.com for today's looky lookies, our Renee scarf. I think this is number five, our Miss Chi Chi shades. And remember this, the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves, you have a good one.